Okay, before we get started this morning, I just want to thank you guys for the opportunity to let me be able to do this. Uh, I'm kind of, this subject has been a subject of mine for a long time. It took me a long time to, I don't say I fully understand it, but I understand it a lot better than I did about 30 years ago. Um, so let's get started. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt amongst men. My example is he. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross, where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Oh, that old rugged cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. In the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous attraction for me. Oh, excuse me. Uh, start that line again. In the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For twas on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. Revelations 13.8. This is going to be all from the King James Version, so I hope you guys can follow me. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of the Lamb, of the life of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Revelation 17.8. The beast that you sawest and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now if you're wondering why I read those after I just read what I read, it's because there's a statement in those verses that I want us to connect to. This says the doctrine, no, we can go back to the beginning there. This says the doctrine of positional experiential truth. We're going to touch on the fact that God knew beforehand what was going to take place. And so in these verses, it is very clear that those who are not written in the Lamb's book of life were known before the foundations of the world just like those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life were known before the foundations of the world. So I want, those were the, that's what I want you to grasp out of those two verses, is that whatever's taken place has been known before the foundations of the world in eternity past. Luke twenty-two fifteen, Jesus says to his disciples, and he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. We want to thank you again for this opportunity that we have to be able to share your word. Father, I pray that what is said here this morning will be understood, will be grasped, and that we all can go home with a little bit better knowledge of what took place and why. Father, I pray that we would all receive from you what we need to receive from you this day as we ask these things in Jesus' precious and most worthy name. Amen. Today, in the time that we have, I would like to address these truths. There's a group of Christians who I believe misinterpret Scripture to a point of, dis of disregard for these truths. 
the cross, and the meaning of being in Christ. To believe and teach that we, through no mindful act on our part, have no say in our believing in Christ or not, and that faith through grace does not exist, and that God elects, chooses, picks, you call it, who he wants and who he don't, is wrong. They believe that the free will of man and the sovereignty of God do not and cannot coexist. Therefore, Christ's death was strictly for the church and no one else. That is total heresy, and in my feeling, definitely anti-biblical teaching. The Bible teaches that man's free will and God's sovereignty do coexist. And if they don't, then please explain Genesis chapter 3 to me again. Adam and Eve made a choice. They disobeyed what God said, and then God made a choice. Genesis 3.15, John 3.16. God would put conflict, opposition, friction, etc. between Satan and the woman, between his seed and the world of evil and death, and her seed, the world of truth and life. And so because of his so great love, he gave his only uniquely born son to die and to suffer, to offer rather, life and reconciliation to mankind. If that is not coexisting, then I will stop right here. But it is. God made a fix for the problem. Now that I believe I have set a little background, let us continue. In order to discuss this subject, we must start and end with God, with the cross and with the believer mixed in. I hope to be able in the time that I have to bring, you, to, bring to you a sort of short version of a subject that is so vast in both its subject matter and its implications to the believer. Therefore, we must start with God. We must understand who God is, his essence, and from here we are. From his book, The Unfailing Love of God, Pastor R.B. Thiem gives us a little tidbit of it, which I think is quite good. The Bible, the infallible work of, word of God, is the only textbook, the single communique about God, his thoughts and his divine love. In fact, the Bible defines God in terms of attributes so that man can contemplate and understand the character of God. The attributes of God are sovereignty, righteousness, justice, love, eternal life, omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, immutability, and veracity. All of these divine attributes are of equal value. No one attribute, no attribute compromises to his essence. Oh, I skipped the line. No one, no one attribute overrides another. They work in complete coordination and harmony without any compromise of his essence. And if you remember, Pastor Eric mentioned that about maybe two, three weeks ago, about how all of the attributes of God are never alone in their own little bubble. They all are interlinked together. All the attributes of divine essence are present in God, but they are not always apparent at the same time. The properties of light illustrate this concept. Every color of the visible spectrum is resident in a ray of white light, but the individual colors are only seen under different circumstances of reflection and refraction. Likewise, God's essence may manifest certain attributes in one situation, but others in a different situation. In every case, no matter which attribute is reflected, God's total, indivisible person is completely involved. Okay, and next slide. We're going to take a quick look at these. Um, we have sovereignty, God is supreme power or authority. What he says he will do and what he does comes to fulfillment. Okay, and these are the scriptures you can look up. Uh, righteousness, he's just, lawful, acting in accord with divine or moral law, free from guilt or sin. Justice, impartial and fair and if he wasn't genesis 315 would have worked out a whole lot different uh, 
Love, agape, benevolent, God's love. Eternal life, it's a God quality of life, a life of no end, free from all that we know and see. Omniscience, all-knowing. There never was a time when something was not known. Before the foundations of the world, both believer and unbeliever were known. Jesus said in John 3, I believe it's verse 18, that those who believe will have eternal life, but those who do not believe are, are condemned already. Okay, so nothing has ever escaped the eyes and knowing of God. Omnipotence, all-powerful. Omnipresence, he is at all places at the same time, not subject to time and space. Immutability, not changing or unable to change. God can never change his mind, can never go back on his word. Never, because of his own righteous and his justice and his love. Next slide. Veracity, conformity to facts, accuracy, biblical, uh, habitual truthfulness, he cannot lie. Merciful, to be compassionate or to have kindly forbearance toward an offender, an enemy. God is not wishing to give us what we deserve. And that's proof in John 3.16. What we deserved was to die, and he didn't do it. Gracious, God wishing to give us what we don't deserve. That is also in John 3.16, because he gave us his son, who went to a cross, and then, not only that, but he gave us eternal life if we believe. Did we deserve any of that? We deserved the big boot in the backside and then go to the hospital to have it taken out. That's what we deserved. Let us take a look at grace. Pastor Eric has given us to us a good and complete definition of grace, which we should never forget. But I want us to see it from a different angle. From his book, Giving, Pastor Theme Jr. gives, I believe, a great definition of grace. Next slide. Definition, grace is all that God is free to do for man on the basis of the cross. Grace is the plan and work of God on behalf of mankind. Grace depends on the essence or nature of God. Grace is what God can do for man and still be consistent with his own essence. This is illustrated by propitiation, and we all understand what propitiation is. God is capable of loving man with a maximum love, that is, a believer who has passed the point of propitiation. Okay, and all that basically is telling us is that once we have believed in Christ, why? Because Christ satisfied the wrath of God at the cross, we can have maximum love from God. Grace is the antithesis of legalism and or Olson nature production. Legalism is man's work or ability intruding upon the plan of God. Legalism is the enemy of grace. When you start feeding in things that don't belong in the church, then you are no longer preaching grace, but preaching legalism. All right, faithful. No, I kind of got lost. There we are. He is loyal, constant, true, devoted, unswerving, unwavering. He is dedicated, steadfast, committed, trustworthy, etc. In short, God says what he means and means what he says. In 1 John 1, 9, which I have listed there, it says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Faithful. What he said he would do, he would do. We name them, he forgives them, and they're done. Why? Because of what he said he would do because of the cross. Next slide. Next person to speak of is Jesus. 
And I didn't write a whole lot of I didn't write a whole lot of things about Jesus because as we see here as a member of the Godhead all the attributes of God belong to Jesus as well Philippians chapter 2 says that Jesus was equal with God first John 1 1 says that Jesus was with God and that he was God John 17 5 says and now O father glorify me with your own self with the glory which I had with you before the world was so you see that all that we attribute to God can also can and is attributed to Jesus as well oh, I gotta go back I'm going faster than the slide next slide okay now we come to you and me big troublemakers next person to speak of is man <laughs> man made in the image of God Genesis 1 26 and 27 Colossians 3 10 man was given free will which means he is free to choose his destiny heaven or hell you're free to have a cup of coffee or you're free not to once saved he is also free to choose whether or not he walks in the spirit God does not interfere or choose for him remember the sovereignty of God and the free will of man must coexist or we become puppets to the puppeteer from Genesis to Revelation man has had the opportunity to choose back in Leviticus when God was setting up with Moses the sacrifices he made it a point to tell Moses that those who came with sacrifices had to do so willingly willingly my friends is a choice I can either give the dollar in the basket reluctantly and under compulsion or I can give it willingly with love and devotion He is told that to have a good life, a life of meaning and purpose, there are things he needs to do. These are the imperatives of scripture. Remember this, man is free to choose. Man is not free not to choose. And man is not free to choose the consequences or blessings of his choice. God blesses you based on his justice you don't go to God and say okay God bless me with a great big airplane look at what I've done for you God says big deal you will be blessed as I desire to bless you what the righteousness of God demands the justice of God carries out Adam and Eve made a choice Cain made a choice Esau made a choice and the reason why I picked Esau is because this group of Christians that I'm speaking about or that I've mentioned have a thing with Esau because in Malachi and I believe it's in Romans both uh, Malachi and Paul well Paul used the statement of Malachi is what it was but Malachi says that God hated Esau and loved Jacob so these people will say God made a choice he wanted no part of Esau he hated Esau and he only wanted Jacob well here's the fallacy to that if God hates then God's a sinner now he does hate but not you what he hates is who you are without Christ Esau was without Christ and God knew from the foundations of the world okay Jeremiah uh, I believe it's Jeremiah and David said the same thing that God knew them before they were in the womb okay so before the foundations of the world God knew Esau and he knew what Esau was up to and he knew Jacob and he knew what Jacob was going to wind up becoming okay so Esau made a choice and yes Satan did too that's why we're in this mess 
because Satan made the choice to rebel against God when he was the most one of the most powerfulest angels there was in heaven he was like God's right hand man okay and chose to rebel said I want to be put myself above God and God says ah, ah, not here and because he refused to repent of that decision God condemned him and cast him out of heaven now we're in this mess today because Satan believed and I don't know if I cover it here but if I don't if I do we'll just read it again that's all but Satan believed that that was unfair how can here's your here's your question that people feed you every time how can a loving God condemn somebody to hell he doesn't you do you do we do it with our choice next slide now that I believe we have established some basics let's look at how they tie together in eternity past God made a plan and a choice Ephesians 1 3 through 14 that choice being to place all that would believe in Christ in Christ omniscience knew who would believe therefore God placed those who would believe positionally in Christ before the foundations of the world that's what Ephesians chapter 3 or uh, chapter 1 tells us that in eternity past God chose to place us in Christ to be holy and blameless before him being placed in Christ places us in his nature and makes us heirs and co-heirs with him. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Again, theme in his book on uh, in the integrity of God has a great explanation for this too. I love this man. In case you don't know that, I do. <laughs> his, his, his teaching, you know, between Eric and him the teaching is so phenomenal because i get it from i get the same information from both ends maybe in a little bit of a different angle but we reach the same conclusions in union with the glorified christ as he is seated in the place of honest honest highest honor psalms 110 1 hebrews 113 Hebrews 10 12 we share all that he is and has we share his election Ephesians 1 4 his destiny Ephesians 1 5 Romans 8 28 through 30 his sonship Galatians 3 26 2 Timothy 2 1 his heirship Romans 8 16 and 17 his priesthood Hebrews 10 10 to 14 his sanctification 1 Corinthians 1 2 his royalty 2 Peter 1 11 his righteousness 2 Corinthians 5 21 and his eternal life 1 John 5 11 and 12 next slide as members of the royal family of God we actually possess a double portion of God's righteousness and eternal life the father's righteousness is imputed to us as it is to believers of all dispensations in order to set up the grace pipeline but in addition through the baptism of the Holy Spirit and union with Christ we also possess the righteousness of the second person of the Trinity First, Second Corinthians 5 21 the same is true for our eternal life all believers must have eternal life in order to live with God forever that is why the Holy Spirit's ministry of regeneration is for the entire family of God and not just for the royal family now what he means by the royal family is those who have received Christ and who are on motion to grow now the whole family is also those who receive Christ but have decided not today Lord not today Lord but they have eternal life just the same God has promised that okay uh, we should miss it okay 
But royalty receives a double portion. The father's life is imputed to us and the son's life becomes ours through current positional truth. We have his because we are placed in Christ. John 14, 6. Instead of living, and I like I liked this one. I've never heard this um, uh, portion of, there's a portion of scripture, I believe it's in, it's in Romans chapter 6. I've never heard it explained this way. I've heard it explained other ways, but never this way. Instead of living under the rulership of the ex-husband, the old sin nature, we are now in a position to live unto God. Romans 6, 8 through 10, Ephesians 2, 5 through 10. Positional truth demands a new way of life, compatible with the exalted relationship between the resurrected, resurrected humanity of Christ and God the Father, at whose right hand he sits. This is a supernatural way of life, not in the sense of hocus-pocus mysticism, but in the sense that we depend entirely upon the resources of God. Through truth, we learn to harness and utilize divine resources, and by doing so, we exploit the fantastic riches of God's grace. Next slide. When we are born, we begin to live and experience life. Until we come to Christ, we live being under the influence of Satan and his army. But God, and I love that, but God, but God is at work too, though not directly guiding us, but indirectly allowing things to come our way to bring us to the moment of decision making. Until that moment, we live an experiential life, not under God and Christ, but under, sin and, but under Satan and the old sin nature. But at the moment we hear the gospel and come face to face with Christ, a decision must and will be made for or against. When we say yes to Christ, we then begin to live experientially in Christ. God at that moment gives us some 40 things that are, uh, that are ours forever. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Our spirit is made alive and he takes up residence within us. Never to leave us nor forsake us. Ephesians 1.13, Hebrews 13.5. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and we must spend every day being filled by the Spirit through the reading and studying of the Word. Let him build us up and make us into the image of Christ. Then one day when Christ returns to take us home, our positional life and our experiential life will meet and be joined together to complete us as we receive our glorified bodies and become as he is. Now I want to I want to just quickly read Philippians chapter 2 and Hebrews keeps popping up. You got something to tell me, huh Hebrews? Philippians chapter 2 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. Wherefore... Paul's thought don't end there. Because now he says that just because of that, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Ephesians chapter 1, 3 
through 14. And I believe Eric mentioned this when he was talking about this. This portion of scripture between Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, we read it in whatever translation you want to read it in with periods, ends of sentences. Of course, the English language has no other way to put it. But in the original Greek, 3 through 14 is one great big paragraph. Paul never put a period anywhere. His thoughts just kept flowing as one paragraph. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, according as he had chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory and of his grace, wherein he had made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he had abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mysteries of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself. What's the mysteries of his good will? Right here. His good will is mentioned here. And it's no longer a mystery to us. It's a mystery to them, but not to us. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who had worked all things after the counsel of his own will. That we should, I've got to stop there. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will. What was his will in eternity past? Well, I think it's time to bring out the drawing board. I had a funny feeling I'd have to wind up doing it this way too. Well, I'm going to put it over here. Clint, you can shut this off. We don't need it right now. As a matter of fact, that's the last one. I want to put this right here so everybody can get a peek at it. And get this eraser out of the way. Yes! That wasn't supposed to happen. Sorry about that. Did we lose anything? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to do this now. So why I don't get in my way no more. Okay. What was the pleasure of his will? In eternity past, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit decided that they wanted to create a family. They wanted to share their nature with others. And I forgot to put the others. Isn't that a shame? But his omniscience, his foreknowledge, and his foreseeing, which is all the same in my book, knew that there was going to be a problem. That creating creatures with which to share and give free will would turn to rebellion and sin which Satan started and man followed. But God, rich in mercy, okay, Ephesians 2, 4, and, and since I'm here, I want to read that. But God, who was rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ. Okay? But God, rich in mercy, made a plan. That plan, salvation, redemption, 
justification, reconciliation, all of that, plus others. There were other things he did for us at that moment. But how was it going to get done? The cross. But who would go? Whoever, had, whoever was going to go had to be free from sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Jesus, because of his great love for his Father and because of their oneness together and the love that would be offered that he would love the created beings chose to be the one to go. He was nominated. He chose, nominated, and elected. So when the Bible talks about you being the elect, remember, he was elected. You are a member of that election. The benefits of him being elected and what took place on that cross, you have been elected as his children to receive those benefits. And all because you said, yes, Lord, I believe. Philippians 2, 5 through 8, he was obedient unto death, even death of a cross. As a result of his giving, as a result, he was given a name which is above every name and exalted. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, which is what we read. Um, I'm going to take this, I'm going to finish reading this. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ in whom you also trusted after that you have after you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of your inheritance until the redemption and redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory so in turn, from what he was given, because God loves you and wants to give to you, he allowed all those who would believe in him to be placed in Christ, to be holy, blameless, to be adopted, to be sealed by the Holy Spirit, and to become the very image of Christ, who he is. Ephesians 2, 3 through 14, Romans 8, 29, and 30. This, my friends, is positional truth. There's no getting away from it. Genesis to Revelations teaches all this. As long as you have a choice, all of this is where you belong. If you have no choice, then we can just turn this board around because it doesn't apply to us. If God sits there with Satan up there in heaven, like Satan would go up before him when he went up before to go talk to him, and he said, well, what about Job? You know, let's work on Job. They were talking, okay? God doesn't sit up there and say, okay, here we go. Here's my list. Well, today I think, Satan, let's, let's pick another few people. I think I'm going to take Clint and JD and Charlotte and, and I'll take Tammy and Brenda and Joanne and whoever and you can have that guy and that guy and that guy and that guy for your team. God don't play tiddlywinks with Satan. God knows just like even he knew about Job. In eternity past that Job would go through all that Job went through and come out smelling like a rose. Satan didn't know that. See, what people don't understand is as smart and as powerful as Satan is, he don't know the beginning from the end. He has no idea what's going to take place in the end. Oh, he does know that as believers we are going to heaven. He does know that Christ is coming back. And he does know he's condemned to hell. That he knows. But the details, other than what's in this word, what's in God's mind, he has no clue. He don't know when it's going to end. He don't know how it's going to start. Who's going to start it. He hasn't got a clue of that. He only works within the realm of his, what he sees and what he knows. So that's positional truth. We are positionally, we positionally are complete 
one day uh, and one day when we are raptured and given our new bodies our position and our experience will be joined and we will be fully complete we will be glorified right now we are being sanctified to this point every day one day when Christ comes back and we go with him our experience and our position will meet will join we will be glorified and we will look and be as he is but for now we must walk in experience we must experience who Christ is we must walk in our in our uh, uh, life according to the Word of God we must walk as God chooses for us to walk because any other way we get into trouble and if you don't believe that just spend some time reading the Old Testament Israel did that plenty Israel one day was high on the mountain enjoying the blessings of God and the next time the king come along <laughs> down in the valley and what did it bring them disaster it brought them it brought them bondage look at how long they were in bondage to Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and he destroyed that temple no more temple worship they didn't have it in Babylon either okay destroyed it why because he warned them if you do not walk as I command and as I tell you that's what's going to happen God doesn't give a command without the warning behind it and we have to live with that in an understanding not that we fear anything because listen we do we still do have the old sin nature we will have that until we are raptured or we die first whichever comes first that old sin nature will always be there and we will always have that inclination to go the other way but we must always remember that he is more powerful who is in us and we can live an experiential life that would bring us a tremendous amount of blessing and we would, we would be so much better for it because as we grow in maturity we'll be able to handle all the disasters that come our way without falling apart like a puzzle being dropped on a floor and when we do that when we learn how to live that way we can almost I would have almost ventured to say that we might even begin to experience a little bit more of what that position is all about because positionally you're in Christ positionally you are complete your glorification positionally is already done it was done before the foundations of the world God completed you why because he doesn't live in time and space God sees the beginning from the end Jesus says I am Alpha and Omega beginning and the end there is nothing that they don't see there was nothing they don't know and everything was done when God made that plan okay when God made the plan here it is when God made this plan that was done in eternity past now like I said in the beginning this subject I gave it a little tidbit boy I wasn't kidding when I said tidbit but this subject is a very deep vast subject you can spend who knows how long in just studying the ramifications of what your position in Christ really is we hit it pastor Eric hits it on a Sunday and he'll tell you that's the position and that's your position but if you were to sit and really study the whole realm of it nothing else just try to understand what that is all about It'll take you forever because there's so much the scripture teaches about your position and 
Believe me, it's not only in the New Testament. If you understand and know how to pick out what you need to know from the Old Testament, you will see that God had planned in the Old Testament for Israel to enjoy that too. They chose not to. And the few that did, like Abraham, like David, okay, uh, uh, the prophets, for the few that did got to understand it, though they were looking forward to this cross as we look back. Nevertheless, the Bible says that Abraham's righteousness was credited to him. God put it on an account and said, when the right time comes in the fullness of time, you will receive that righteousness, my righteousness. So I hope that I did something that uh, you can take home with you, think about, and maybe even dig in a little bit more on your own. What I want to do is, as we close, there's a hymn that we used to sing. And I was only going to read the chorus, but I'm going to read the first stanza. King of my life, I crown you now. Mine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. When you doubt who you are in Christ, go back to the cross. That'll tell you who you are in Christ. You have something you want to play or? I need, need this thing out of the way? Again, I want to say thank you to you all for the few minutes that you've given to me. I appreciate it. And I hope that uh, this was a helpful lesson for you today. Thank you.